What we mean by equilibrium conditions and non-equilibrium and entropy and negative entropy is not really that complicated, but it's an area where a mystique has grown around it because they really struggled for a hundred years to properly express things. Some of them they're still struggling with. But basically, let's start with entropy. What we mean with entropy, it originally was just dissipated potential. That's all it was. And it meant I'm dissipating some energy that the system previously had under its control and could use. It now no longer has that much energy. And all that entropy is, is a measure of that energy that got out of, that's out of your control. Maybe you used it to power the load, or maybe it went out in losses or whatever, but you lost control of it and you can no longer use it. You didn't destroy the energy, it's still out there. But uh, you can't use it anymore in the system. That's all entropy is. It's nothing magic, nothing mystical, or anything. It's a measure of the energy the system had and could control and use, but it no longer can do that with it. That's how much it's given up. By the same token, if you want to be consistent, negative entropy would be when you give it some more energy which it can control and which it can use because now it has additional energy. So its entropy has decreased from what it just was when it had lost all the other and no replenishment. So, but I involved what's called a non-equilibrium condition. I, I actually opened that system, although they use the term open in a very restricted sense in thermodynamics. I need to change that. But I opened that system and I allowed some energy to freely flow in there and the system to catch it free. Once it gets in there, it doesn't matter who furnished the energy. I furnished it, nature furnished it, the vacuum furnished it, whatever furnished it. As far as the system is concerned, I just reduced my entropy because now I have more energy again under my control and I just had a negative entropy operation. So negative entropy is not anything mystical either. It's just the acquisition of, by the system of more energy that it does control and use. That's all it is, a measure of that. If you have a system in equilibrium, it's already sunk as low as it can use any energy. All the energy it could use, it's gotten rid of, and it's a condition of maximum entropy. Look at all the energy I had when I wasn't in equilibrium. Now I've lost all of it. So I don't have any more to lose, maximum entropy. But if I depart from equilibrium, what I mean is I allow this flow now to come in and extra energy exchange that I can grab and use. So I lower the amount that's lost as far as the system is concerned. It now has some extra. So as far as the system is concerned, its entropy decreased. I haven't lost as much now really because I've got all this new replenished. And so I now have it available again. That's all it says. There has been more fuss and fury and raging and uh, absolutism and uh, name calling and everything in the world about entropy and negative entropy. And about 95% of it is foolishness. It's people who haven't looked at what the concept really means and nothing else. Or you just assume equilibrium. Second law, as it's written, assumes the system is in equilibrium. It's already reached maximum entropy stage. So, uh, obviously with that, if it's, uh, if it's in equilibrium and nothing else is ever going to come in, the equilibrium is not going to be broke. You're not going to reduce the entropy. It's already lost. So, it says it very nicely. It says... Uh, you can either, the only thing you can do with the entropy is have it increase or else you can keep it the same. Because you're never allowing anything else to come in. That's all that means. It has no mysticism at all. It's not a magic law of nature that you can't break. Every time you flip a light switch, you violate the second law of thermodynamics. And when you violate the second law, that doesn't mean you violate the first law. You do not violate conservation of energy if something gives you the energy. So if you're take that to heart, even from thermodynamics, you go around looking for effects or phenomenology or things that are known that do give you some energy. Well, we did this early on. Sailboat. The wind will give you energy. So you can happily sail your sailboat in total violation of the second law of thermodynamics and sail right on around the world and very simply. A windmill. 
It's continually receiving energy in a form we well understand, wind. We understand wind because it blows on us all the time. And it'll blow us down if it gets strong enough. So we understand that the windmill continually gets energy into it from its environment because the wind gives it to it. We don't have to pay for it as long as it gets it. And the windmill very happily runs along violating the heck out of the second law of thermodynamics. It does not violate the first law. Every bit of energy that it gets in, what it wastes and what it actually gives you in the load, is absolutely put into it, but it's put in free by the environment. So many things have been made absolute which are, shouldn't be absolute at all. We should go back to the simple meaning, what we're really talking about when we say, I've lost energy control of so much energy. And every real system has losses that's operating and doing things and doing work, it has losses. And you do lose and, and you do gain in entropy that way because you lose control of energy. Big deal. All you have to do is see that the energy keeps getting input to it and replenished. And it'll very happily keep replenishing the energy control that it lost and that's negative entropy. If it's in a steady state condition, it's producing negative energy as fast as it's producing positive energy. If you're drilling in a piece of wood with a drill, at a steady rate and doing steady work, you're, you're violating the heck out of the second law. You're doing negative entropy all the time and positive entropy at an equal rate. You have a non-equilibrium steady state condition. There's a special thermodynamics branch just for non-equilibrium systems. So you don't take the thermodynamics of equilibrium systems and start beating people over the head that are using non-equilibrium systems because it doesn't even apply. So one thing we need to do is for everybody to get straight on the thermodynamics they're talking about and realize that when we're using charges in electromagnetic fields, electromagnetic potentials, we're using flows of energy and we automatically have a non-equilibrium system. We are permitted to violate the second law of thermodynamics. Take a good textbook in non-equilibrium thermodynamics, Condeputy and Prigogine modern thermodynamics and they cover everything on down to dissipative systems. You will find in one area on page 459 as a matter of fact, you will find they list the areas already known and recognized by thermodynamics themselves as violating the second law. Uh, one of these is very sharp gradients. Just make sharp pulses, sharp gradients. And you mess with the vacuum, you mess with whether the electrons stay in the Dirac holes and all kinds of things and you involve excess energy inputs to your system and you can violate permissibly the second law by the simpler thing as sharp pulses. Let's talk about motors and why we don't violate laws like that and why we don't go over unity, why we don't produce more energy out in a motor than we put in. And let's talk about how to do it. Well, we will do that. If I have a, a standard, what's called linear magnetic motor, I'm going to make a very simple one in concept here. Imagine two rails running. Instead of parallel, they diverge just a little bit as they run, and they're about this long. So these rails are not quite parallel. They are diverging just a bit. But the rails are really the north pole heads of a bunch of magnets on each side, north poles facing in. So what I really have is this rail, this gradually spreading gap between actually two long linear north poles. If I stick another north pole in this rail, in this slot, this linear magnetic motor, what will happen is it will develop a thrust because just ahead of it, there's less, the north poles are further apart and there's less north polarity density there than there is here. That looks like a little bitty south pole and it's a north pole so it'll get attracted that way. This little car that I put with this little north pole on it, for example, will then accelerate right on through this linear magnetic motor. That's a piece of cake. It's in every electrical engineering set of handbooks and everything else. And then plenty of experts on linear motors. Okay, let's say that we want to make that a closed loop system and we want to make that thing run itself. Suppose I take this rail, this gradually diverging rail of, of uh, opposing magnets, and I turn it in a circle and I almost close it, but I leave a little gap. Well, the fact is the rails are diverging just a little bit all the way around. And 
if I have a rotor, the little car, the little magnet now in the North Pole is on the end of a rotor, the rotor will accelerate all the way around to where this gap is. Continuous acceleration, building up torque, building up uh, angular momentum, everything else, picking up stored energy. Now, however, I have a problem. That's the forward MMF region, magnetomotive force region. This little gap is the back MMF region, where I'm now against the field. So suddenly, if I allow this thing to just go on through the gap, I'll pay back everything I gained, and I'll have some losses in the systems. This system will not run. I could give it a big crank to start, and it would just run right down. And that's it. And stop. Well, I would rather not do that. What makes it stop? What makes it stop is that the back MMF is the same as the forward MMF, and I'm licked before I start. That's Lorentz uh, symmetrical regaging, and I have built a system which, if I leave it like that, will enforce, self-enforce Lorentz symmetrical regaging. I'm never going to get an extra watt out of that system. In fact, I won't quite get out all I put in because it does have some friction in the bearings and it fights the air resistance. So I lose a little bit. It will always be a coefficient of performance less than 1.0. Well, people like Takahashi looked at that and they said, the problem is, suppose I could get rid of this back MMF section. If I could do that, he wasn't saying I would violate Lorentz symmetrical condition, but he would, he would. That's what you would do. And then you could have a self-powering, self-rotating system. Remember, all the energy is coming out of the vacuum through the dipolarities. It isn't coming out of what we put in or anything like that. So what we would do, or what Takahashi did, is he put a pole piece, a little piece of metal, like an inverted T with a handle on it sticking up outside that that crosses that gap. And he put a little coil on that handle. And he put a little tiny, tiny current just barely going through that coil. Now, he's paying for that. He's paying a little bit, not much current. And as this magnet, which is accelerating around through the, the rotor, through the forward MMF, as it's just entering this zone, this overlaps that end of the forward MMF a little bit, you sharply break that current that's going into the coil on the inverted T pole piece. What that does is invokes Lenz's law. Fortunately, that one's in the electrical engineering textbook, and so the electrical engineer understands what I'm saying. And momentarily, there is a surge of increase in the current. Now, if you had that arranged so the field that it makes it is in opposition to the EMF field, momentarily, you have a very strong field, a much stronger field up here, that's stronger than the back MMF, and you convert it to forward MMF. You paid a little for it but not nothing like what you have for just a moment. Sharp gradients, right? Can violate the second law of thermodynamics. That's already proven in non-equilibrium thermodynamics. I don't have to go reprove it. So what happens is the thing accelerates right on through what had just been the back MMF. Now the next instance it's back MMF again, but it's okay. Back MMF doesn't do anything to me if I don't let it affect me. If I don't let it ever be able to influence me. So what I did, I skimmed right by it when it had no effect on me. And in fact, the temporary field that we had made was, in fact, an accelerating field. I paid a little bit, but I got a motor which, overall, I gained. And now I'm in COP greater than one. I have to charge myself for what I feed the coil. Everything else is permanent magnets. But that engine will rotate and produce much more power that you can put a generator on the shelf and so forth then you have to furnish to the trickle charge to your uh, uh, pole piece. And if you use very efficient switching, you've got to be very efficient here, but well within the state of the art, you, any electrical engineering department can easily build a COP greater than one Takahashi motor. The fact that they do not do so is absolutely inexplicable. Everything we said is in the physics book already. How known is Takahashi's work? Uh, Takahashi's got a patent on it, and so you can go get a copy of the patent. You know, you can find out exactly how he did it in the patent and so forth. And that motor will work, and any electrical engineering department in the United States and any national laboratory can build it. It's a Japanese patent, isn't it? It's a Japanese patent, but they also, I think there's a U.S. patent part of it is under a U.S. patent. But anyway, this is, an, uh, this is a 
unit which could easily be built at our universities, in our national labs and everything, and then settle this argument once and for all.